These are chapter two uh, notes from the social psychology textbook of the what, eighth edition by Vagon and Hogg. The topic I'll be uh, discussing, or rather reading out, is social cognition and thinking. They include the topics of social psychology and cognition, forming impressions of other people, social schemes and categories, how we use, acquire and change schemas, social encoding, memory for people, social inference, and effect and emotion. To begin with, social psychology and cognition. People think about their social world, and on that basis they act in certain ways. Thought is the internal language, and we use symbols. Uh, this is often a conscious process. Cognition is broader and refers to all the mental processes that can be largely automatic. Both are mental activities that mediate between the world and how people behave. Social psychology, I mean social cognition, is the cognitive processes and structures that influence um, influence and are influenced by social behavior. And there's uh, basically a history of cognition in social psychology, which includes Wundt in 1897, who was the founder of modern empirical psychology and used introspection. Behaviorism uh, ignored cognition and focused solely on observable behavior. In 1960, Chomsky introduced how people represented the world symbolically in language. Then you have uh, Gestalt Psychology, which is the perspective of uh, the whole and how that influences the, per the perception of its constituent parts. Lewin in 1951 extrapolated that uh, Gestalt to Social Psychology, uh, in which ideas of people's perceptions of social relationships in their world uh, could be manipulated as such by saying like, uh, individuals pertaining to having certain characteristics when probably there isn't, or certain characteristics um, showing or highlighting certain people, certain like whole, whole personalities of people where there are also probably none. So cognitive consistency is the model of social cognition, which uh, is where people try to reduce inconsistency among their cognitions because they find inconsistency unpleasant. Basically, no one wants to look like a hypocrite. There's naive, there's the idea of a naive psychologist in which a scientist, um, in which people, it is assumed that people uh, think like scientists. And this model of social cognition characterizes individuals as rational, scientific-like, and function on the basis of what cause and effect analyses to understand their world. Attribution is the process of assigning a cause to our own behavior and that of others. There's a cognitive missile, which is a model of social cognition characterizing people as using least complex or demanding cognition, which are able to produce generally adaptive behaviors. And these are social cognitive shortcuts. Basically, uh, it's a heuristic. It's trying to avoid using too much cognitive demand, especially when uh, there's only a limited process, limited for process. Anyway, uh, there's also another thing called a motivated tactician, in which it is a model of social cognition characterizing individuals as uh, having multiple cognitive strategies available, basically choosing among the basis of personal goals and motives and needs. Then you have social neuroscience, which is an exploration of brain activity associated with social cognition and social psychological processes and phenomena. It is methodologically reliant on fMRI and other devices to deduce function of a certain area in the brain. Forming impressions of other people. We are quick to use personal traits when describing others, even those we just met. We communicate these impressions uh, to others and use these as the basis of deciding how we feel and act. What information is important? Configura no, the configural model was proposed by Ash, uh, was to do with Ash's gestalt-based model of impression formation, in which central traits play a disproportionate role in configuring the final impression. Central traits are the traits that have disproportionate influence in configuration of final impression, as I said before, uh, and there's peripheral traits, which are traits that have an insignificant influence on the co configuration of uh, final impressions in Ash's configural model of impression formation, as I said before. Okay, both these traits are correlated intrinsically with others, contributing to a constructed impression of a person, and uh, this aligns with the Gestalt view that impressions are formed as part of an integrated whole, which rests on correlations of traits with other traits. There are biases, of course, in forming impressions, since Ash in 1946 found that order of presentation of traits mattered in the, well, development of these impressions of individuals. They include privacy, which is the order of presentation that, effect, that affects which earlier presented information has disproportionate influence on, um, on the impression. And recency, which is the order of presentation where the latter uh, said traits influence disproportionately the impression. Positivity and negativity. People tend to assume the best of others and form positive impressions, according to C's 1983, and are particularly sensitive and are particularly sensitive to negative information. Information is unusual and distinctive. Uh, it attracts attention. Information indirectly signifies potential danger and is given precedence for survival value. Personal constructs and implicit... Uh, behavior, implicit personal theories. Personal constructs are idiosyncratic and personal ways of characterizing other people. For example, they might find certain traits to be uh, the single most important organizing principle. Example, uh, intelligence. There are also implicit personality theories, which are idiosyncratic and personal ways of characterizing other people and explaining their behavior, as well as uh, physical appearance counts. So we have a tendency to use appearance or attractiveness to judge whether people are morally good uh, and intelligent or competent, even though there's basically no correlation of that happening. Stereotypes are widely shared and simplified evaluative image of a social group and its members. Then you have a social judgeability, which is the perception of whether it is socially acceptable to judge a specific target. People are less likely to form impressions if social rules or norms slash conventions prescribe making judgments. If social judgments, uh, if one socially judges or if one is socially judgeable, then individuals would rely on the target and consider it to be of great confidence in making the said judgments. Cognitive algebra. It is said that how people evaluate and judge impressions of others is through uh, Basically, a formation and focus on how people contribute and combine attributes that have no valence into the overall positive or negative impressions. Such as, for example, this summation, in which it's a method of forming 
uh, positive and, or negative impressions by summing the valence of all the constituent person attributes. There's also averaging, which is basically averaging those positive and negative uh, traits together, impressions. Uh, weighted averaging, which is a method of forming these impressions by weighing and then averaging the valence of all constituent person attributes. The weights reflect perceived importance of information in certain impression formation contexts and differences between ash and weighted trait perspective. Weighting averaging perspective uh, basically believes that there's a belief that central traits are more salient than heavily uh, weighted than heavily weighted information. Are more salient and heavily weighted information. Central traits are more salient, are more salient and they are heavily weighted information. Ash believes that central traits influence the meaning of surrounding traits, reorganizing uh, entire, the entire way we view the, the person. Social schemas and categorization. Schemas are cognitive structures that represent knowledge about a concept slash type of stimulus, and they include attributes and the relations among those attributes. It is a set of interrelational cognitions, such as uh, thoughts, beliefs, and attitudes, which allow people to quickly make sense of the situation or location or event. Schemas basically help fill in the gaps or the missing details. There's scripts, which are schemas for events. They help to facilitate a top-down, concept-driven processing approach. The, co the concept of cognitive schemas was founded by Bartlett in 1932 uh, on non-social memory, in which he focused how memory are actively constructed and organized to facilitate understanding and uh, behavior. Ash in 1946, of course, constructed his configural model of impressions, and we have Heider's 1958 balance theory of person perception. There are types of schemas, which include scripts, which include scripts as previously stated before. Uh, person schemas are knowledge structures about specific individuals, for example, traits of others. There's also role schemas, which are knowledge structures about role occupants. Basically, for example, doctors are defined by what they can do and not do. So, for example, they can ask personal questions. These roles are patterns of behavior that distinguish between uh, different activities within the group and interrelate one to another for what, the greater good of the group. There's uh, content-free schemas, which do not contain rich information about specific categories and a limited number, have a limited number of rules for processing information. They might just specify how to attribute a cause to someone's behavior. Self-schemas are people's schemas about themselves, representing uh, represented through stored information about themselves. They include what, either more complex... Oh, they have more complex information than they store about other people. Categories and prototypes. To apply schemata knowledge, first you need to categorize a person, event, or situation as uh, fitting a particular schema. Wittgenstein, in 1953, proposed fuzzy sets, which are categories considered to be fuzzy sets or features organized around a prototype. Fuzzy sets are sets because they have uh, fuzzy boundaries. A prototype is a cognitive representation of the typical or ideal defining feature of a category. They are relatively unorganized, fuzzy representations. Schemas, on the other hand, are more concrete and organized. Some do not always occur depending on the circumstance. There's family resemblance, which are defining properties of category membership. And when prototypes vary, family resemblance is asserted and category membership is decided. Categories are all organized hierarchically. Categories are organized hierarchically and uh, are less inclusive, or rather more specific categories, which are nested beneath more inclusive ones. Exemplars are specific instances of a member of a category where certain people may represent the certain category. Uh, Brewer in 1988 has stated that as people became more familiar with a category, there was a shift from prototypical to exemplar representation. Associative networks are models of memory where nodes slash ideas are connected by uh, associative links, along which cognitive activation can spread. Perceptual accentuation, which was proposed by Tajvel in 57 and 59, specified how processes of categorization might be responsible for stereotyping or reasoning that making judgments on some dimension, people rely on other peripheral dimensions. For example, people use the color of wine to judge taste differences. So basically using things that are completely uh, irrelevant to, to judge about something else. You have the accentuation principle, which is categorizing, uh, basically accentuates perceived similarities within and differences between groups of dimensions that people believe are correlated with the categorization. You get a thing called the accentuation effect, which amplifies where the categorization and or dimension has subjective importance, relevance, or value in. Social identity theory is related to this because it is a theory of group membership and intergroup uh, relations based on self-categorization and social comparison and the categorization of a shared self-definition in terms of in-group uh, defining properties. Self-categorization theory, uh, proposed by Turner et al., uh, is a theory of how processes of categorizing ourself as a group member produces social identity and group and inter-group behaviors. There's a uh, beyond a situation such as a lot like stereotypes and not consensual beliefs, but rather just general theories. I'm not going to get into that right now. Okay, how we use acquired and change schemes or schemas. People rely on basic level categories, which are neither too inclusive nor too exclusive, and uh, they access social stereotypes and role schemas rather than trait schemas. They're more likely to use schemas that are cued by easily de detected features, such as skin color, dress, physical appearance, distinct features in certain contexts. And people tend to cue mood congruent uh, schemas, uh, such as, for example, Urban 1991, which is based on earlier rather than later information, i.e., like primacy effect. Circumscribed accuracy, which is a fairly automatic scheme, queuing uh, processes are functional and accurate enough for immediate interaction purposes. So basically, people need to use more accurate schemas. They shift from theory driven towards data driven cognition. Uh, there's individual differences in the use of schemas, such as, for example, attributional complexity, where people vary in the complexity of the explanations of others. There's uncertainty orientation, people vary in interest in gaining information. Um, of what certainty of others. There's a need for cognition where people differ in how much they like to think deeply about things, and there's a need for cognitive closure where people differ in how quickly they need to tidy up cognitive loose ends and move to decision. Uh, move to a decision. There's cognitive complexity which people differ in the complexity of their cognitive processes and representations. Another thing to consider is accessibility, which is the ease of recall of these uh, categories of schemas that we already have in mind. Acquiring schemas. Schemas become more abstract, less tied to concrete instances as more instances are encountered. 
they can become like more richer or complex uh, as a result of more like more experience of the person or event or place. And um, yeah, the schemas become more resilient, so they're more difficult to change once once they reinforce. Uh, Rothbard talked about changing schemas in 1981, such as like bookkeeping, which is a slow change in the face of accumulating evidence. There's also a conversion, uh, which are sudden and massive changes that once a critical mass of disconfirming evidence has accumulated, uh, you change the schema, basically. And there's also subtyping, where schemas morph into subcategories to accommodate uh, disconfirming evidence. Social encoding, uh, the next part of this video, is basically the way in which we, uh, we process external social stimuli. Uh, and basically how they represent it in the mind. They include pre-attentive analysis, which is the automatic slash non-conscious uh, scanning of the environment. This focal attention, which are stimuli are consciously identified and categorized. And comprehension, which is uh, how does this stimuli give meaning? Or, yeah, they basically give a meaning. And uh, this elaborative reasoning, which is the stimulus is linked to other uh, knowledge to allow for complex inferences. These depend heavily on what captures our attention. Salience is the property of the stimulus that makes it stand out in relation to other stimuli, and they attract attention. They include uh, novelty, behavior, breaking expectations, goals, etc. Vividness is the intrinsic property of the stimulus on its own that makes it stand out and attract attention. It can be uh, emotionally attention grabbing, uh, concrete that the, the image provoking, the image provokes uh, and is close to you in, in a certain particular context. Accessibility, like what priming, is the activation of accessible categories of schemas in memory that influences how we process new information. There's a category consistent manner, which is to encode stimuli even when, when it's ambiguous in a certain way, and there's a category incongruent manner, is how people are aware that a category has been primed often a contrast stimuli, often with a contrastingly like, different stimuli within the category. Next part of this. I'll be talking about is uh, memory for people, so there's a propositional model for memory, which is a general idea that we store propositions that consist of nodes or ideas linked by relationships between ideas, and these links are associated or associative in so far as nodes are associated with other nodes, and these these contents include, or nodes, include traits, appearance, behaviors of other people. Uh, they also involve things like uh, group membership and has previously discussed social identity theory. Social inference is um, basically addressing inferential processes uh, through what formal and abstract intuitive and concrete means used to identify, sample, and combine information to form impressions that uh, make judgments, that help make judgments. These are automatic, uh, relying on top-down approach, but can be like uh, deliberately relying on bottom-up deductive fashion as well. Uh, there's the normative models, which are ideal processes for making accurate social inferences. Uh, by what, like comparing it to the norm, I think. There's behavioral decision theory, which is a set of normative models or ideal processes for making accurate social inferences. There's a departure from normality, regression, for example, is a tendency for initial observations, for instances, to form a category to be more extreme than subsequent observations, and you have base rate information, which is a power of factual statistical uh, information about the entire class of events. Co-variation uh, judgments are how strongly two things are related, and they are essential to social inference to form the basis of schemas, which help assess uh, strengths between relationships. There's illusory correlation, which is a cognitive exaggeration of the degree of, the degree of co-occurrence of the two uh, stimuli or events. And basically we perceive like there's a correlation between the two where there's probably none existing at all. Associative meaning, there's an illusory uh, correlation in which two things uh, they belong together because of what, like, it meets prior expectations. Pair distinctiveness, which is illusory correlation where items are seen as belonging together because they share some unique, I mean, unusual feature. Heuristics are cognitive, uh, short cuts that provide adequately accurate inferences that most of us are types on the basis of overall similarity or resemblance to the category. There's the availability heuristic, which are cognitive shortcuts in which frequency of likelihood of an event is based on how quickly instances or associations come to mind. And you have the anchoring and adjustment uh, heuristic, which is cognitive shortcuts where inferences are tied to initial standards or schemas. Improving social inferences, we are biased and misrepresent people. Shortcomings can be overrided through education in rational thinking and science. Uh, then there's also like effect and emotion which is like how social cognition focuses on thinking rather than feeling mostly uh, there's different situations that can evoke different emotions from the same situation and the same situation can also evoke different emotions for different people there's um, antecedents of effect such as for example cognitive appraisals where there's different effective uh, reactions and psychological responses uh, follow on there's effective responses or emotions which is a mode of action readiness tied to appraisals of harm and benefit and these appraisal processes are continuous and they're also largely automatic this occurs in large part of the largely within the amygdala, which is the part of the old brain responsible for fast automatic um, emotional reactions. You have primary appraisals which generate emotions uh, quickly, and then you have the secondary appraisals which generate more complex emotions, and these are more slow, slowly. These occur more slowly, such as, for example, envy, envying others. There's consequences of these effects, such as there's an effect infusion model, in which cognition is infused with effects such as uh, social judgment, reflecting the current mood. For example, uh, Phobos says that there's a direct access to these, uh, to set memory of judgment. And then there's a motivational processing, where they form a judgment on the basis of specific motivations to achieve a goal or to repair an existing mood. Then there's a heuristic uh, processing, which relies on various cognitive uh, shortcuts or heuristics, and substantive processing, which is the deliberate, uh, careful construct construction of a judgment from a variety of informal sources. Emotional regulation include what collectivist society disapproves of overt uh, emotional expressions and there's a reductionist uh, idea in which explanation of phenomenon is uh, to do with terms of language and concepts of a lower level of analysis, usually with a loss of explanatory power. So yeah, in, well, as revision, 
point summary, I basically talked about social cognition and thinking and uh, how we form impressions of other people, the social schemes and categories that we use, how we use and acquire, as well as change schemas, social coding, memory for people, social inferences, and how affected emotion uh, influence cognition, well, social cognition. Thanks for watching.